Hi, welcome to the last webinar segment. Um, this webinar is about cosmology, which is the study of the history of the entire universe, starting from the Big Bang around 13.8 billion years ago. Cosmology is a pretty tricky business conceptually. Um, at least for me, I remember struggling a lot to wrap my mind around some of the things that we deal with in cosmology. Um, and now with the benefit of hindsight, I think I can distill uh, my personal sources of confusion to two main phenomena. And those are um, an effect that I'm going to call the snail mail delay and the expansion of the universe. So the snail mail delay is basically the following idea. If you send a letter via mail to someone across the country, it's going to take some time for the letter to get there, maybe a couple of days, a week. Um, so what that means is what, whatever information that you wrote in that letter, when the receiver actually reads it, it'll be old news. Um, whatever the receiver is actually learning is something that was true a week ago, but might not still be relevant anymore. And of course, if the receiver is in the state, same state as you, then the delay is less, maybe one or two days, but there's still a delay. Um, astronomy works the same way. Light is fast. It's the fastest thing in the universe, um, but it's not instant. Um, it takes time, and because the universe is so unfathomably huge, it takes millions or billions of years for light to get from one galaxy to another. So when we're studying other galaxies, we're getting the same snail mail delay, um, and what we're seeing is actually a view of the past, and the further away that galaxy is, the further back in the past we're seeing. Um, okay, so that's one. The other one is the expansion of the universe, and that's a distinct effect um, that only compounds on the confusingness of the snail mail delay. So if, if space itself is getting bigger, what does the notion of distance even mean? Like, or, or when a galaxy is moving away from us, is that because it's actually moving away from us, or is it because the expanding space between us is increasing our separation? Or is there even a difference between those two things? And the answer is sort of, depending on how you think about it, and I don't really have time to um, go into detail about this, but um, if you want to read more, the keywords to Google are um, proper distance, co-moving distance, peculiar velocity, and Hubble flow. Um, but there's one really important case where the snail mail delay and the expansion of the universe um, sort of um, interact and produce an effect, and that's redshift. Um, redshift is a pretty suggestive name. Um, it refers to any time you've got some light that appears redder than it should um, or that it um, originally used to be. Um, and we measure redshift using a number, which we label Z, um, which is related to the original wavelength and the observed wavelength, the formula is right here. Redshift usually happens because of the Doppler effect. It's the same reason a fire truck, siren, um, is at a lower pitch when the truck is moving away from you. Um, and in this case, the velocity of the object is what causes the wave to be stretched um, into a longer wavelength. Um, and many times, this is the source of redshift in astronomy. But cosmological redshift actually comes about in a different way altogether. Um, and what happens is that a galaxy very far away emits some light, and that light is traveling towards us. And while that's happening, the space is expanding. And if the light takes a long time to get to us, um, which is the snail mail delay, then the space will have expanded a non-trivial amount and the wavelength would have stretched with the space. So the more space has expanded, the more the redshift. And also the longer the travel time, the more expansion there is. And also the further away, the longer the travel time, that's the snail mail delay. So all four of these things, the expansion of space, um, the observed redshift, the distance to the object, and um, look back time, which is how far in the past we're seeing, they're all related to each other. Earlier I said that the highest redshift we've ever observed is approximately Z is approximately 10. Um, and this corresponds to a very, very distant galaxy whose light was actually emitted a very, very long time ago when the universe was much, much smaller than it currently is. 
Um, and for context, the redshift of the nearest galaxy cluster, which is the Virgo cluster, it's about 59 um, million light years away, is 0 0.0038, so small redshift. The expansion of space is measured using something called a scale factor, denoted by little a. It's a measure of relative length calibrated so that a equals one today. So in the past, the universe was smaller and a was also smaller. To kind of help get an intuition for it, you can sort of think of it as the diameter of the universe um, measured in terms of today's diameter, although this isn't a fully accurate uh, way to think about it. Um, but it's good for like intuition, I guess. The expansion of the universe is basically measured by how fast the scale factor changes over time. And as I mentioned earlier, it's intimately related to redshift. So if we know how much the cosmological redshift has, if we know how much cosmological redshift has occurred for a given, you know, very distant object, then we can calculate the uh, scale factor of the universe when the light was first emitted. And that's the equation right here that relates um, scale factor to redshift. Um, as expected, when the redshift increases, uh, the scale factor decreases since it's in the denominator. And this just basically tells us that high redshift objects correspond to light that was emitted when the universe was very small. Um, observationally speaking, it's easy to report the redshift because it's very easy to measure, but converting a redshift into a particular time, like some million or billion years after the Big Bang or something like that, um, is extremely tricky. And the reason is because the expansion of space is not a constant thing. It's slowed down and sped up in different um, eras of the universe. And the exact formula to calculate the expansion of the space as a function of time is called the Friedman equation, spelled F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N-N. -N. And you can read about that on your own time. It's a little too involved to talk about here, but um, yeah. Okay, those are the fundamentals. Um, let's do a crash course on the history of the universe. Um, we know expansion has been happening since the beginning, um, the Big Bang, about 13.8 billion years ago. As I mentioned, it hasn't been expanding at the same rate the whole time, uh, which is why this picture sort of looks like um, a sideways bell. Um, there were a lot of significant eras and events in the history of the universe, but I'll only touch on a few of them. Okay, let's talk about the first 400,000 years. That might seem like a long time, but it's very short in terms of the universe's age. If the universe was like um, a 17 year old high school student or something, um, this would be, this would correspond to the first four hours of its life. Um, so in this first era, the universe was filled with a bright, hot soup of particles, um, protons, neutrons, and electrons, and none of them were combined into atoms yet. They were all separate from each other. And this gas of particles was opaque, which means that all the photons that were produced by this hot gas were basically like bouncing around between them, all between all the particles, kind of like the inside of a star, except it's the whole universe. And just like a star, the radiation that was produced by all these hot particles um, was a black body spectrum. And as the universe expanded, the temperature of this hot gas cooled and the black body spectrum reflected that. Um, and so, after 400,000 years, at the end of this period, the gas was just cool enough that the protons, neutrons, and electrons started combining into atoms. And when that happened, um, the gas suddenly became much more transparent. And so from here on out, the black body photons that were bouncing around could just go, like fly freely through the universe. Um, so yeah, and at, at this time, the radiation was peaked at around um, the visible light range, close to the visible light range with an effective temperature around 3000 Kelvin. Um, since then, the universe has co uh, expanded a whole bunch more. And so um, because of cosmological redshift, all that light has correspondingly been redshifted. And incredibly, the math works out that what used to be a black body spectrum at 3000 Kelvin is now still a black body spectrum, but just at a much colder temperature. 
And what this means is that radiation is still flying around the universe and it still looks like a black body spectrum, but now it's peaked in the microwave band with an effective temperature of just three degrees above absolute zero. And this is what we now call the cosmic microwave background. It's basically just the leftover light from when everything was a much hotter soup of particles. And before falling onto our telescope, um, the last time all these photons ever interacted with matter was when the universe was only 400,000 years old. So if we study this relic radiation, um, then we can learn more about what the universe was like back then. So that's the first 400,000 years or four hours if the universe is a high school student. Um, and in this hour, in this analogy, another six months pass before the first stars and galaxies start to form. And after that, um, galaxies form and things look a lot more similar um, to what they look like today. Let's talk about the bell shape here. Why, why does it look like that? What actually controls the expansion of the universe? As I mentioned earlier, um, it's the Friedman equation that tells you how the universe expands. And the equation basically says that the expansion rate is sort of a tug of war between um, matter, radiation, uh, the curvature of space, dark matter, and dark energy. And this tug of war is a really complicated situation. Um, when I took a cosmology class in college, we basically spent the whole semester just talking about this. Um, but for Science Olympiad, it's helpful to know a thing or two about the two main players in the game, dark matter and dark energy. Okay, so let's compare and contrast them. Um, they don't really have much in common, uh, despite, despite sounding a little similar. Um, the dark just means that we don't understand them very well. Um, it's basically a PR stunt uh, to make it sound like cool and mysterious. Um, the main thing to understand about them is that dark matter pulls things together via gravity and dark energy pushes things apart. Um, dark matter accounts for um, basically a mysterious gravitational forces that uh, are otherwise unexplained. And so like the flatness of many galaxy rotation curves are one prototypical example. Um, the leading hypothesis for dark matter is that there is literally a new type of matter that we can't see and we can only detect via its gravitational influence. And if that's the case, then dark matter is thought to account for 85% of all matter in the universe. Um, with the other 15% basically being regular matter that we are all familiar with, the stars and galaxies that we can see with our telescopes. Another possibility is that we just don't understand gravity as well as we think we do, and maybe it just works differently at like large galactic scales. Dark energy, on the other hand, um, is basically a mysterious force that causes the universe to expand faster. Uh, we call it energy because when you do the calculations, it has the same units um, as energy, and it's thought to be a property of the vacuum of space itself. Um, in, in the technical parlance, it's sometimes called the zero-point vacuum energy, or also cosmological constant, although um, the term cosmological constant also has like a, a rich historical connotation that dates back to Einstein. Anyways, um, in the current age, in the current era of the universe, dark energy is the most powerful factor out of all the ones that I mentioned earlier. Um, and that explains why the universe is expanding faster and faster. In, in other words, why this picture from before, let me see, um, kind of has this flaring um, bell shape in the present day. It's the dark energy accelerated expansion. Okay, uh, finally, let's um, end with the case study. This is the bullet cluster, which is actually two galaxy clusters which have collided head on with each other. Um, the name bullet basically comes from this image, which on the right hand side um, sort of looks like a pink bullet flying through space. If you're imaginative enough, um, this, this pink is a color code. So it's not actually pink. It's a color code that represents X-ray light. Um, and X-rays are some of the most energetic light that we see. And so when we see this big blob of x-rays, uh, we can make an educated guess that um, 
this represents a cloud of gas, which is very, very hot. Um, and this makes sense. When, when two huge clouds of gas uh, collide with each other at really high speeds, then both clouds heat up a lot due to friction. Um, and that's what these two pink plots represent. It's the two clouds of gas that have passed through each other and heated each other up. Uh, but we can also use gravitational lensing to learn more about this DSO. Remember that gravitational lensing is when a massive object um, bends the light coming from behind it, therefore distorting the image of whatever's behind it. And in this case, by observing the light and carefully figuring out how much it bent, um, astrophysicists can figure out where the mass is, and that's shown in blue. And what's surprising is that it doesn't line up with the pink, which is where all the hot gas is. The explanation is that most of the matter is um, particle dark matter, which passes through itself uneventfully. And because there's no friction in dark matter, uh, it ends up further where the blue is. Um, the, the, the remaining regular matter interacts and there's a bunch of friction, which slows it down, which is why the pink blobs are lagging behind the blue blobs. So many astronomers believe that this is very strong evidence that dark matter is in fact a form of non-interacting matter, as opposed to the other hypotheses where we just say, um, oh, we just have to modify our theory of gravity. Um, that being said, there are subtle arguments that suggest that the bullet cluster is not quite the, um, the, the smoking gun for particle dark matter, um, no pun intended, but those arguments are probably beyond the scope of science only data astronomy. So um, just like, I guess it's important to try to understand what the arguments are here for um, why this um, it counts as good evidence for uh, particle dark matter as opposed to modified gravity. Okay, um, this was a really long webinar segment because cosmology is very rich and conceptually a very challenging topic. Um, but I think it's worth learning about because um, it sort of ties together a lot of the topics from this year. I hope you guys have learned something from this series and can apply it to your competition season. Uh, so good luck this year.